not quite sure what to do with myself. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know what would be a good thing to do then? Since we're both speechless at this point, why don't we go to someone who knows how to speak quite well? How does that sound? <laughs> then we'll yeah. get back to your uh, speechlessness a little later. So <laughs> look who I got. I know. Hey, <clears throat> I, you know what? I see someone that uh, I know quite well, uh, respect quite oh, well. And I'm mute. Uh, no, you're okay. you're I'm live. Am I am I live? Am I good to go? You are Classic good to Filipino go. fashion. <laughs> 30 minutes late. And I, I see you compensated for my height, by the way, with me stacking the microphone on the books. Oh, I feel so short. <laughs> well, at least I didn't put the books on the chair. That's true. That's true. <laughs> like in my car. Yeah. You know, when I, go, when I drive. It's uh, good to be back here in San Diego at the, uh, at the Sparks Gallery this time. Uh, but it's, it's the Chuck Jones Gallery. It's so nice to be here. Uh, Half of my uh, son's college fund is here, uh, <laughs> but I get to I get to hang it all on my walls at home. Oh, I think yeah. I'm I, I I might be the only person that can say he's the proud owner of uh, Chuck Jones animation cells from a movie called Stay Tuned, starring John Ritter and Pam Dauber. That scene where they get zapped into the Chuck Jones mouse world, and I have that hanging in my kitchen. Oh. It's one of my most prized possessions, as well as animation cells from Mrs. Doubtfire that Chuck Jones Ooh. worked on as well, oh. that I bought from you guys. Dude. So, and I think I own some stuff from Gremlins, too. So, yes, my entire son's college fund uh, is here. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay, Doc. I'm going to teach him how to do this voice, and he's going to be fine. <laughs> Well, it seems you worked out for you, and uh, I'm glad you you named some awesome uh, uh, films there. I mean, uh, Chuck, and that was the early '90s that that uh, um, they asked him to come back and do the Stay Tuned uh, film with John Ritter and Pam Dauber, and they were obviously huge fans of Chuck, and and uh, uh, so I think he enjoyed figuring out what the characters were going to do in that and what the mice did, but still my favorite character in that entire segment, RoboCat. Yeah. So it was, yeah, yeah, that mechanical now. had all the gadgets and everything. Yeah, yeah I, the, the cell that I have is, is a profile of uh, RoboCat with all the missiles and guns aimed at the, uh, the two mice. Yeah, it's, yeah. Again, still, still some of the best drawings uh, that I've ever seen. Uh. Now, I, I, you know, I, so we get everybody who's on here introduced. I, I you know, what Eric, um, by the way, everybody who's, who's out there outside of Comic-Con, because when he came in, there was a huge round of applause and, and uh, you know, everybody bowed down to the, uh, the voice of Bugs Bunny and all the other great Looney Tunes characters that he portrays these days. But, you know, I want to make sure, I'm not sure that you have actually, you know, Ben, obviously, who's hanging out here and you can put Ben yes. on with, uh, with Eric, but, uh, but also, hey, you know, we've got... what's up Ben, how's it going? <laughs> I was hoping to see you here in person. And yeah, well, he is here in person. He's just on the other side of the country. So I yeah, see. yeah, we all thought about it. And of coming. course, I can't forget Mr. Fabio. How are you, Doc? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there. <laughs> So, you know, the four of us just get to hang out for a little while and everybody else who's out there in the land of, uh, of Comic-Con and in, uh, uh, around the country. But I think we've almost got... starting to get packed and busy in here, too. You got to see the, the, yeah, the crowd, I, is, I, the crowd I, is thickening up. Thickening. That's uh, quite the uh, viscosity that's happening in that it's region. A, uh, so the, that's the, good. The, uh, it's thickening. Thickening up. <laughs> Not thickening, but thickening in viscosity. <laughs> So I, By the you way, know, I now I now own this microphone with all the saliva that's on. Yeah, well, so. that's okay. You know, we're you're not to... gonna you, you can bring this back to Best Buy. I'm telling you, they're not gonna take it. Uh, okay, they they have receipts. Yeah, that that's a, no, it's good. It's good. Mine are all digital receipts, so they can't ever take a look and see what's on it. It's all good. So you missed. I don't know if you missed a couple of layout drawings that I, we uh, did because I know that you're a big fan of you know, layout drawings and the characters and your collector yourself. But hey, Scott, let's go back to what's Opera Doc because, you know, I, I'm not sure you saw that one, but um, I, I went- I would I went, love to take a peek. I went foraging for things that nobody had ever seen before. And here's an original wow. layout drawing from what's Opera Doc 1957 known as the greatest cartoon 
ever created uh, as established by uh, a thousand animation professionals. It was the first film that was inducted in the National Film Registry in 1992. Uh, first, first animated film that was inducted uh, and probably the greatest uh, layout drawing that I've ever seen from the cartoon because it's the perfect pose of Bugs Bunny right in that moment, you know. So um, I, I, I pulled this out wanting to share it with Ben and you. And then as a plus, I got Fabio to be able to drool a little bit. We didn't invite them in person because I didn't want him getting the artwork wet. So uh, <laughs> I would have totally, it would have, it would have been a very bad deal for me. But what I wanted to say was, you know, as, as we're getting going, I think like Fabio, our, I, I know he's got his 50th anniversary for his in-laws tomorrow. So I'm not, and, and we're, we're three hours ahead of you. Yeah. I, I yes. Think, do you have, do you have to sign off or are you? Well, it's, it's, I, I have to say, for one is I, I am not in my home. Like I said it before, I'm in a friend's home. Yeah. It, it, it is almost a quarter of 11. So, ooh, ooh. It, yeah, and I have like a half hour drive back to my my establishment. But it was a it was a pleasure meeting you guys. Thank you once again for everything. Love the story. By chance, are any of those sketches going to be for sale? Or are you just going to put them back in a hole you just found in? No, <laughs> that would be some. That would be something you have to ask Scott about. Literally, okay, that would be I'll reach you out. Have to ask Scott about. There's okay, a of them that just blew my mind. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, Thank before you, guys. you leave, Fabio. Yes. Was there one voice that you wanted to hear from Eric before you started going back to your in uh, establishment in Maine? Henry Hawk. Oh, Henry Hawk? Yes. I'm a root tootin' lasso, loop loopin', pop gun shootin' chicken hog. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, it. take it easy, son. Now, son, see that house that says D O G over there? That smells chicken. Go get him, boy. <laughs> yeah, that's a big chicken. That loudmouth schmuck sent me over to try to cook you. <laughs> Henry Chicken Hog. I relate oh, to him so much. That was awesome. We're like, the, we have the same silhouette and, uh, you know, oh. we, we almost look the same. But yeah, oh. I mean, uh, I mean, you, you had uh, What's Opera Doc, yeah. You're going to kill me with your spirit magic helmet. Magic helmet. Magic helmet. <laughs> yeah, you got to say that, right? You got to sing these songs. Oh, Boonhilda, you're so lovely. <laughs> yes, I know it. I can't help it. Yeah, I've been practicing, guys. This is this is what you do when you sit in Los Angeles traffic. You kinda... Oh my God! Oh well, look, there, Thank now, you. there are people. There, there were people here, and now they're leaving. So all right, all right, Fabio. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys very Safe much. Travels, awesome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Next all time right. we'll do it, but with legs. Exactly. Yeah, we'll be in person. Yeah. I okay. actually have pants on. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't stand up yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's I got shorts. Oh, uh, it's, oh, oh. oh my god. <laughs> Uma Thurman shirt. Oh, it's oh fantastic. yeah. There it is. All right, guys. Go. Thank All you. right. We'll see see ya. ya. Bye. Good right, night, buddy. <laughs> Oddly enough, uh, Quentin Tarantino at, at his theater in Los Angeles plays a lot of the classic Looney Tunes shorts uh, before some of his movies. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a big Looney Tunes guy too. And, you know, he's another one of those uh, cinephiles and, and film fans that still tries to find the original 35 millimeter prints for stuff, uh, whether it's his films or classic films. And he, rumor has it, I still haven't been to one of the screenings, but he will show a classic Looney Tunes short before some of his films uh, well if you ever awesome. cross paths with him let him know that i would be glad to bring up some of chuck's personal 35 millimeter uh cartoons to show at his theater uh, we should do uh, it because he, uh... uh... he and chuck were became good friends in the 90s and uh You're kidding me no they, they obviously quentin was a, a big fan of chuck's and if you look at uh one of the uh the clips from Chuck's 1996 Lifetime Achievement Academy Award, it was he was probably the most enthusiastic. In the, he got the Chuck got the standing ovation, and and you know it was it was heartfelt after he you know, came on to stage. And Quentin Tarantino is in there. He's got a noisemaker in his hand, and he is just mm -hmm. ripping it up like this, just screaming <laughs> at the whole thing, and so. Uh, but he came over, there are pictures of him uh, before we got back onto, we being Chuck Jones Film Productions, got back onto the lot when my mother was producing the cartoons over in the Daltz building, just off the lot. And uh, 
uh, that was about 1994. And Quentin and some of his friends came by to visit Chuck and and hang out. They they'd met before, but he spent some time with him. And there's a picture my mother loved. There was a uh, fake cow somewhere in Hollywood that she just admired, uh, life size. And so she had the cow in the in the in the entryway to the studio. So uh, her name no was Mo- her 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 name was Moviola. And so, you know, and, and there was a sign on it that said, please don't tip the cow because the animators would come in and, and literally tip over the cow to the wall, tip over the cow on the animation tables, tip over the, wherever the cow was, there was cow tipping going on. So there was a sign on it. And so there's a, there's a picture of Quentin Tarantino in there putting change on top of the, uh, the cow, tipping the cow. So it was very nice to to tip the cow. So... (laughs) But he and Chuck were good, and and uh, so anytime I, I we would love to bring up. I've got Chuck's personal it, collection of thirty five millimeters. It's it's kind of amazing, and I'm sure uh, Ben can relate. Being a, like a modern artist that is influenced by the work of Chuck Jones, Quentin falls under there. And another one comes to mind is is Jamie Hewlett, who's like the creator of the Gorillas. Uh, I don't know if you've seen in the past uh, on his social media, he's posted Chuck Jones in like completely Chuck Jones style influence drawings of his uh, of Daffy and Bugs. And it's just remarkable to see because it's a completely, you know, coming from his style, going to the Chuck Jones thing, you really see. And you know where I see it most is in the way uh, Jamie Hewlett draws clothes, the way Chuck Jones draws clothes. Anytime Bugs Bunny's in a cartoon, a Chuck Jones short, and he's wearing a suit with a hat and shoes and a tie, and like, there's so much attention to detail in those sleeves and the way the, the cuffs like fold. It, 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 you know, I wish I looked that good in a suit. <laughs> Not gonna happen. <laughs> Not gonna happen. <laughs> well, I, you, there is, I think, as you said, the detail of it. And this is one, and I, I'm not sure whether or not you saw the sheep in the deep one that you can put up, Scott, if you want, that uh, Eric can see. But, uh, you know, Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog from 1962. Thank you, Joel. Uh, to, uh, I know it's coming up right here, um, where he's slinking along. Um, he's mm-hmm. switching over to full screen. There it is. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and which is one of the great relationships. And Fabio did a, a uh, Ralph and Sam uh, painting with, uh, oh. with his characters that, that was released uh, this week. And so, nice. uh, you know, we found this. And, and so, as I said, some of these are, are things that I literally scoured for that no one has ever seen before, that I'd never seen before. Uh, you know, I went hunting for uh, wabbits but, uh, and, and, <laughs> and sheepdogs. But, uh, and then Porky Pig, uh, the next one. But we kind of going through, and, and I know you appreciate the, the character. And so, <laughs> you know, so oh. I, is there a certain, you know, banter in – Robin Hood Daffy that that you appreciate the most with Daffy? Or? I mean, it's it's crazy because you don't ever really hear these characters yeah. laugh. And in this short, they both kind of take turns kind of laughing at each other, right? And they, you, you can actually almost hear the similarities or, you know, uh, almost actually Daffy and Porky, when Mel Blanc performed those voices, they were both kind of performed in his kind of mid to lower range so when he was uh performing the voice of daffy his voice was actually in the sylvester area like <laughs> suffering fuck a tash but he just played it different he played it a bit more you know uh, gave it a bit more edge and when they sped that voice up it became daffy which i think is richard dreyfus with a lift you know <laughs> If you watch now, I've ruined Daffy for everyone. Uh, I'm not going to be a hot meal for some shark. Mayor Vaughn, what we're dealing with here is a perfect eating machine. Yeah. um, And Porky, if you've ever uh, had a chance to go on YouTube, uh, there's uh, these uh, old military shirts that Mel Blanc performed, I I assume. uh, And the character was called Private Sad Sack. And it was the uh, the uh, see, it's the see, uh, same thing. Uh, he was doing a uh, see, it's a see, uh, stutter, but it was in this range. And for, you know, he he was a, a drinker and a smoker. You know, as as yep. everyone was yep. in the forties. Yeah, uh, twelve and up was the drinking age back then. But for whatever reason, that magical grit and girth to his voice 
when they had sped that that character up, you know, it, it had that uh, the, a, a, a grip. It, it had that to see a, a, a stutter. Uh, so it's amazing what he was able to do with these personalities. I, I don't even think of them as character voices. They're they're full blown personalities. Uh, but you really hear the similarity in the laughing. It's something that you almost can't control uh, with your voice. So if you ever watch this short back, Robin Hood Daffy, and just cue it up to the laughing part where they're both laughing over each other, it's it, that's where you're like, oh, it could be the same guy. I can't. But with, <laughs> with, I but with uh, you know, but with Mel Blanc, you always have to question, is it the same guy? Because it sounds like uh, two people. <laughs> I will rob him of his gold and give it to some poor, unworthy slob. That'll prove I'm Robin Hood. Yeah, like these are just <laughs> some things in that short that I love so much. And that's just Daffy. He's not, he's, he's just out there to prove it for himself. He's, he's think, you know, he's classic Daffy the, in that one. I think it's What's one that, Ben? I think it's one of the greatest laugh scenes for me with, with film, period. Because as soon as you get to the part where he's, you know, he's he's hit every tree he's going on the hill like all that stuff and the two of them and and porky's just laughing and they're like belly laughing at it there is there has never been a time where i've watched that film and i don't start laughing immediately you instantly feel better watching that sequence it's one of my all-time favorite laughs <laughs> so out of here in la and i've eric you may have uh, heard it out here in la there was a dj on kale OS way back when and in the evenings uh, just to brighten everybody when they were driving, he had five o'clock funnings and he would always have a stand up routine that would usually run, you know, three or four minutes at least. But he would open that segment two ways it was either the laugh sequence of Robin Hood Daffy or mm -hmm. Tom Hanks from the Money Pit, where he just starts <laughs> laughing and that the end of that, where he's like, <laughs> and he's, you yeah, know, he, can he hardly can breathe. <laughs> Yeah. So, but every single time I thought that is because it really is one of the great laugh sequences in history. And I can't watch it without starting to giggle myself because it, it starts it's, with Porky and then it goes and then Daffy's disgusted, but then he has to laugh as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's again, it's as a, as a study of all these voices, the character voices that Mel Blanc did, it's one of those areas of the voice. And as a, uh, uh, an impressionist, you could be almost too good of an impressionist that the impression is inside the box and the performance kind of suffers. Mel Blanc wasn't impersonating anyone when he did these characters. And when he did stuff like in Bugs Bunny's voice, as we know, you know, Bugs Bunny sounds a lot like this, sometimes mild mannered. But then he would break kind of attitude, not even character, but attitude. Uh, and his voice would go into his regular speaking timber so like he was helping Playboy Penguin out once. It's like, you, you look lost, buddy. Well, you trying to get home? And Playboy Penguin hands him the map and it's uh, with South Pole, right? South Pole yeah, is where he was. Yeah. South Pole? Oh, I'm dying! You know, <laughs> oh, like he would. The North Pole, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah North, North Pole, oh, <laughs> I'm dying! It, it's like, it's that weird scream that he would do that I think if you're like an impressionist, like, oh, like you would never want to try that because that's so enriched in Mel Blanc's DNA. Uh, but I remember trying it, like, I remember those are the times that I would laugh so much, me and my brother growing up watching these cartoons when you can only get them Saturday mornings. Uh, and we would just laugh, like, cause you know, Bugs never loses his cool. And uh, I tried doing it for a couple of shorts and thank goodness the fans didn't, uh, you know, like pull the seams apart. They were like, hey, he, he did the scream. He did the, the Mel Blanc scream. So, so I that's wanted, awesome. Thank goodness. I wanted to ask. Hey, Boyd. You, hey, Boyd. <laughs> you had mentioned when we, when we had Red Dot, and uh, first of all, you made Linda cry. So um, you brought Linda to tears. <laughs> that, was a, that was a fun time. And again, always an honor to be here with you guys. Hi, welcome to the gallery. Everything's half <laughs> off. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Comic Con special. You get a free hot dog with every painting uh, or a carrot. Uh, yeah, no, getting to be here with you guys and getting the chat for, for the moments that we do have is always an honor for me because 
again, you know, the, I won't be the last person to do these voices and I welcome anyone that has these characters living in them to give it a try. And uh, I, I cherish these moments. It, it really does mean a lot to me that uh, you guys would invite me to be here in, in the, like, this is like, it's a museum to me. I know it's a gallery, but this really is like a museum uh, of, of moments in our history, uh, in animation and our childhood, really. So yeah. I wanted to ask you, you, you brought up, um, and I thought it was fascinating that you, you were able to, you'll go back and you'll have access to like archive stuff. And you heard Chuck giving comments to, you know, to Mel Blanc and back and forth as they were working on stuff. Yeah. And I was like, what, what, how, like, do you just Did you get find access it? to all that stuff? And so what, what I wanted to ask you was what, what was something that you found in a clip, whether it was, you know, like Chuck with Mel or how that was working where you were like, oh, and it just kind of maybe like, it struck you in a different way. Well, like, uh, it's, it's amazing because uh, as I worked through Looney Tunes cartoons, it was the same thing. Like, uh, I, I would imagine Mel Blanc working with Chuck Jones or Bob McKimson or Tex Avery or uh, Bob Clampett. They all probably had a different way, or Frizz Freeling for that matter, all had a different way to direct bugs in a situation or with a different adversary than the last. Um, and I, I learned an interesting thing today from Alex Kerwan, who is the current showrunner. It's almost like we're meeting these characters for the very first time every time we see them because they were made to be one-offs, right? So if you can imagine a world where it's like, well, nobody knows them in sequence or in a series. Nobody knows that always, you know, Samity Sam is always after bugs. So it's almost like we have to meet these characters for the first time every time. Uh, like you hear that song and we open up on the cartoon and we're seeing these characters interact. That's why we always see Elmer and he always goes, shh, be very, very quiet. I'm hunting Wabbit. Like and we know that. But if you hadn't seen that short, you wouldn't know that he was trying to get bugs, right? It's a very interesting thing to, to think about that every short is the first short not the second short or the third one, but it's always like one of one. Um, but yeah, getting to act with different directors and, and seeing how Mel took direction. He was always like, especially with Chuck Jones, I feel like Chuck was the most focused. And I mean, even in the art style, you know, when we're talking about attention to detail, he was like that, it seemed, at least in, in what I'm hearing in these behind the scenes tracks, he was very meticulous about even the way Bugs Bunny would say bye in a, in a cartoon. And you would hear Mel go, bye, 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 bye. And then you would hear Chuck like chime in on the intercom and say, just say it like this, bye. And then literally Mel would go, bye, the way he does it as Bugs. And that's the take that they would use. You would hear Mel, you know, he could have said it any way, 30 different ways. But Chuck would be like, eh, just say it this way. And that was it. Bye. Well, I, I, <laughs> well, I will say, I, you know, from what, uh, you know, I, I did get to spend a lot of time with June Foray and uh, when she was alive and, uh, and, and some others, but, and obviously Chuck, but, um, you know, a little bit Mel Blanc, but I never talked to him about the way that they interacted. I have heard some of those recordings but one of the things that June talked about is that Chuck understood exactly what he wanted when he came in and that it wasn't a discovery for him. And I think that's part of why I love the, the, the way that these drawings are, the, the layout drawings, that he understood exactly what, you know, he envisioned in his head. And he always talked about that he could see the film. And if he could see the film, then he knew that it could be made. And he, it wasn't always easy. And it wasn't always finished at the beginning when he saw it. But when he saw it, it was clear. And he knew it down to a 24th of a second. And that to, uh, to, it doesn't surprise me at all that he would be able to communicate. And June Foray said he was the clearest communicator of, here's what I want. Here's the way I'd like it. The cadence, the delivery, and all of that. And... And that literally he would, uh, if they were doing a Bugs and Daffy scene, that 
that Chuck would stand there and he would do the lines for Bugs while Mel recorded Daffy and then they'd swap. And so they'd yeah. get the cadence. And so Chuck, it doesn't surprise me that he'd just go in and go, this is the intonation that I'm looking for. Cause he could see the way that the film was gonna be six months down the road, but you gotta get the voice tracks down there so you can get everything timed out and then you can get to your film. And so it, it I, I love hearing, and I haven't heard that one, but I love hearing that it was as succinct as June Foray always talked about. Ah, uh, just check your Gmail. I'll send you the clip later after we're done here. <laughs> okay. He was very precise, like laser pointer precise. Yeah, uh, it, it is amazing, and I and I, I pick up on it uh, so much, and it it gives me so much inspiration when I hear those behind the scenes clips and. You know, even hearing him stumble on some lines makes me feel good about, okay, I, I can mess up too. So that's good. Uh, he, even Mel uh, didn't, didn't get through a read sometimes. You'd hear him chuckle and move on to the next line. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, think about it. These shorts were on average seven minutes, eight minutes. I don't know if there was anything longer than nine at the time. No, but, they were really six and seven minutes for, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. So there's not much recording. So, not much recording, but the recording that they did do, and especially in the, you know, rabbit season, duck season, like that stuff, that back and forth, those are like Abbott and Costello like bits, you know, like they're precise comedy bits that work. Like we're talking about it. It's been 80 years already, you know, like we, these characters are beyond 80 years old now. Yeah. Uh, Tweety's turning 80 this year. And I thought I was only two and a half years old. Uh, he's had some work done. Uh, but, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, these six minute shorts don't have a lot of dialogue compared to a lot of modern cartoons. Like the amount of like when, when I read scripts on, on animated sitcoms, it's like a, like a phone book. It's like it's like this, you know, this stack of books right here. Uh, but yeah. when we get Looney Tunes scripts, it's like five, six pages, seven pages, but it's gotta be precise. It's gotta be exactly what they, what they intended. Well, they didn't edit. That's the thing is they, they were not given any budget to do any editing. So it's not like they could overshoot or redo retakes. It was had to be done because they had eight to 10 cartoons in production. And in five week cycles, you had to get every step of the process done and you couldn't go back and you didn't have any budget to overdo anything. So uh, having everything figured out ahead of time, precision, discipline is the way Chuck talked about it. You needed the discipline to really be able to hone your craft. And you talked about, you know, not a ton of dialogue and, and the music was beautiful. The sound effects were beautiful, but, you know, you, you talk to some people like, uh, John Lasseter and, and, you know, great animators who studied this and Jerry Beck, who's a historian. And they talk about, you know, the difference between, you know, certain limited animation and the type of animation that Chuck was doing as full animation, that you could turn the sound down on a Chuck Jones cartoon and still understand what is going on. Um, yeah. Not to make you, you know, not relevant with a voice and, and music and whatnot, but, you know, the idea that some of the things that were done later by others, particularly for television, that you could turn the, the, the picture off and tell what was going on because it was illustrated radio and, you know, mm -hmm. the sound effects and the voices and the de description of everything. And so very different mentality. And so... The, the character itself goes back again, like I said, to these uh, characters and, you know, like this drawing that's up here now, this is a drawing that Chuck did in the eighties uh, for a future painting that he painted uh, mm. for the cartoon. But if you look at the detail in there, every line means something. And that, you know, I believe that Chuck was the only one who could really capture the exact nuance of what these, characters were feeling at the time and the interaction between them. Now I'm going to challenge you. What would Bugs Bunny say after a bullfight that he actually lost when he was in the, uh, the hospital here that the bull is coming to finish him off? Just curious if you <laughs> had any idea, what would he say? Uh, that's all folks. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I don't have I don't have medical insurance. 
This ain't this ain't Canada. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I really Fade got the black. horns. <laughs> yeah, you again. Stop <laughs> breathing on my tail. Yeah, <laughs> you're wrinkling exactly. it. Yeah, what are you trying to do? Wrinkle it? I love the I love that short between him and the bull. It's it's again. Yeah, speaking of line quality, no lines are wasted in any of these layouts. Uh, like you said, every every line that they've thrown down is there for a reason and just adds to the weight and strength of these poses and characters. So one, this uh, is a very early, I mean, this Chuck would do, uh, Fabio was talking about this earlier, that he would do uh, you know, very roughs to get an idea. And Chuck would do these very roughs because he wanted to know what the postures would look like before any detail goes in. And then he would start to dial in as he would see the, re the, the relationship between the characters. And, and so for him, these were the drawings that were the most important in the development of the scene. Because without those, you wouldn't get the right postures. This is Yosemite Sam, which was not his character, Frizz Freeling's character, but he loved him as a knight. And so he talked about, you know, having him in the garb. But I love Chuck even would kill, uh, you know, Yosemite with the right posture, the right leg position, the right everything and the right, you know, pose, the tribute to, to Frizz. So I, this is a little more uh, polished for a limited edition that he was planning on doing. And then, okay, we're just gonna fast forward, which is great. So this was actually done uh, at Chuck Jones Film Productions by one of the story guys at uh, Chuck Jones Film Productions. I don't, I haven't figured out which story guy did this one, but Scott, if you can bring that full screen, this is from the, uh, the prequel to uh, One Froggy Evening. The, the film oh, wow. with, with, and so this is the one that was done in 1995 called Another Froggy Evening when uh, Chris Columbus remembers uh, his pet frog as he's going across. So this was a gag that, that didn't make the film, but um, the guys would come up with ideas, gags about how the frog would be remembered through time. In that film, he showed up in caveman times and still would only dance for his owner and and sing for his owner and and throughout time but chuck jones film productions i did this is like i said i'd never seen these before going and hunting for it and uh what was the next one scott ah uh, this was a gag again if he were to go into the realm of frankenstein and so this is igor this is a gag series of igor putting it because, uh, you know, when Frankenstein's monster came out, he wouldn't sing. And so Igor got disgusted and go put him under a rock. So, yeah, <laughs> didn't make the film. But That's what uh, I love. Again, <laughs> the, these shorts, Chuck Jones, again, if you're under the Chuck Jones influence, it's like it's he was like like he did bits, you know, like like a stand up comic. It was like these go to always, always work, never failed gags and bits. And yeah. you could just like, you know, just yeah. like the Coyote and Roadrunner, right? It's like, like this. We, we know that the, yeah, we know the Coyote's hungry. know the Roadrunner will always outrun him. Yeah. And here so, it is. And this is an Acme box of horrors. And so the box <laughs> obviously does grab him and pulls him in. What's the next? This is an eight, eight sequence, you know, goes through it, gets spit out, and then he goes walking away. And uh, so uh, that was for Chariots of Fur, which was the first film. Uh, didn't end up in the final uh, gag reel. But this is the type of thing that the guys and Chuck was encouraging the young story writers and, and people to come up with their gags to see how they might work. And so, you know, and that was kind of, in my opinion, it was the type of thing that um, uh, Chuck always was doing things either for others or with others. And uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and, share some things that I hadn't seen. I had seen some of them before, but go to the next drawing. The little history on this one. Uh, yeah, so this was done in the early 90s. And, and, you know, just out of curiosity to tell you, before I tell you what it was for, you know, it, it, if you're Bugs Bunny in this situation, what, how would you be wooing uh, Mrs. here, the, the bunny? Just curious. <laughs> Eric, you're, you probably are the wooer of wooers. 
Oh no, I am uh, I am the worst. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is where I would look to the writers for. Oh, yeah, I'm not that good at that pickup lines. Yeah. Your eyes are as deep as frying pans. Yeah. <laughs> that works. I like it. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm going to say. I wonder back. where the waiter is with our meal. <laughs> Carrot, carrot I've been soup, waiting maybe. so long at this cheesecake factory for my food. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's so amazing. That, I've never that, I, that actually was uh, was drawn for a show that Chuck did in Canada in 1993 that uh, Princess Di was going to attend, and so there was one cell made from this drawing that was given to Princess Di. So <laughs> a little history. Wow. Never been seen before, never been replicated, but this is actually that was created for that purpose. Chuck, obviously, what he wasn't at the show with Princess Di, but um, it was, uh, so it's a little history on this particular drawing, which is kind of cool. And oh. Chuck would do that on occasion. Ben, did you say something? Yeah, let's just reverse for one moment, please. <laughs> Dropping all of this stuff. You know, George Lucas, ah, it's just a thing with Steven Spielberg. We're hanging out at the ranch. And then, oh, this was done for Princess Di. And there's only one made. Stop. Rewind. <laughs> <laughs> so was this given to her as a gift? And then yeah. this, is, this is in the palace somewhere? I have no idea. I don't know where it went after this, but that was, the, that was what it was for. It was made for a gift to Princess Di. And so Chuck came up with, what would Bugs Bunny be like if he met Princess Di? And obviously this is the bunny version of Princess Di. And, you oh, know, wow. he, he I mean, he, had, he, he really appreciated what Princess Di did for the world and how humanitarian she was. And, and so uh, he knew that she was a giving woman. And Chuck always gave, he, he sent people things uh, when they, you know, needed it. And he never asked for anything in return. And it was... Uh, you know, as, as, you know, like the letter and, and sketches that he did for like uh, Byron Howard, you know, the letter and those, it just, it's because he cared. And so the next one was actually uh, um, sent. This one was sent. Uh, this is, I think th this is actually the original, but the uh, a reproduction of this was sent with a note to um, Michael Jordan when Michael Jordan's father passed away in 1994. And so this has just been sitting in the museum archives for for since then, and uh, this was the other version that was done. I, I honestly don't know which one was uh, was sent to him, but um, yeah, I mean it's just little things like that that show that I mean, Chuck didn't he didn't expect a response, but he sent a heartfelt letter to him, and uh, and just because he knew obviously how devastated he was when when Michael Jordan's father was killed, and uh, so and he sent a lot of things to people that uh, that just with notes and Chuck was a great letter writer. I mean, that was one of his, his greatest attributes of, of letter writing. And so he would, uh, he would send, uh, you know, drawings and notes to people, which I always thought was kind of nice. Um, uh, I'm trying to see if there's something else in here that I was going to share with you guys. Cause uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. So this is not the original. This is actually a reproduction that uh, um, the Wall Street Journal asked him to, what would it be like if the stock market, you know, falls out on Acme? And so this was actually published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I think it was, what does it say on there? 19, I can't read it on the It, it says 2022. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there <laughs> oh, oh, wait, oh, wait a sec. No, no, it's like 19, 1995. <laughs> Yeah, 19, oh, pretty, pretty relevant. Uh, yeah, these yeah, days. yeah. So, <laughs> but the internet, uh, Rude Runner Inc. Up. So, uh, yeah, this was sort of, uh, and and people would the the they would ask for certain things, and he'd just draw it because he enjoyed doing it. Um, he also uh, in the eighties he did a series um, called. Um, uh, read to succeed and he was asked by uh, national educations whatever it was to come up with a campaign for uh, schools all over the country for read to succeed 
And so there's a bunch of posters, a bunch of drawings that he did, libraries and whatnot. We have a museum exhibition that actually tours the libraries with some of those posters and the artwork that was for it. But Scott, the next one was part of that series. You might want to make that large so that it can be seen. Uh, this is sort of the, his, this termite terrace in the background and how <laughs> all of the brilliant ideas and characters and, and history came just rolling out of that, that space. And the idea was that just, you know, it, Chuck was a huge believer that libraries were uh, a source of imagination, a source of creativity. And so this was part of that, that uh, sequence of drawings and sequence of communications about reading and creativity. So um, came across this in that, uh, in that collection and it was kind of fun because here's all the characters being spit out of uh, through that. It kind of <laughs> reminds me of Stranger Things a little bit, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, what else did I find? Um, so Chuck every year would, um, would uh, send out for years, would send out Christmas cards. And then he said, as his Christmas list came to, I don't know, six or 700 people that he wanted to stay in touch with. Uh, and he literally would, would draw, uh, have them printed, and they would hand sign and write a note. He and my grandmother would write on them. Uh, it became so arduous with hundreds and hundreds of these that he would send out that it usually would slip. And so, and then for a while it was, sorry, we're late for Christmas. And then he was like, well, forget that. I'm just going to send out New Year's cards. So it gave him all the <laughs> latitude in the world. So this was the, there's a combination. This character goes up in the left-hand corner saying goodbye in 1999 is leaving. And 2000, if you go back to the coyote, um, and, and I think it was a bit of a, uh, a reference to Y2K that, uh -huh. uh, that, that, you know, everybody was afraid that, that you know, the year 2000 was going to crush the entire world because the computer systems will all freeze up. And, uh, and here, you know, the coyote is going to splat amongst the 2000, but uh, obviously, no, that's not true. Um, what else was I going to share with uh, you? Scott, only let's... if you bought an Acme computer, Doc. That's the only reason why that would crash. Yeah. Let's go back for a second, Scott. I want to, I want to share, um, Let's go back to A18. I don't know if, you could, if you've got the same numbering as I do. That's the uh, white seal sketch. Yes. So, wow. you know, we're talking about, you know, Chuck's fine art and whatnot. And so we were, we were back at layout drawings. And, and uh, so can you tell me what, uh, um, which, uh, which film you think this was created around? Ben knows. Yeah, I'll let Eric go. I can't. I can't guess. I. I it, it's 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 in the seventies, so it's it's a later one. It's one of his own. It's a Kipling classic called White Seal, and so these oh, are actually man. some of the sketches that. Uh, and I'll tell you the quick story. Go to the next one, Scott. And so those then translate into well, how do flippers work? How do fins work? How do you know, what does all of this mean? And then it, it translates into the way that the characters would would uh, would swim. So if we go to the next layout drawings, you can kind of get an idea how he creates these, the white seal characters, which, you know, one of my favorite uh, of his cartoons made for television in the early 70s. And Scott, keep going. Um, we're gonna, yeah, so it's just floundering in the water when he's uh, a baby. And then my favorite, I think it's the next one, Scott, yeah. So as he's getting older and the expression and the movement and things like that, but um, you know, it, the, the quick story version and I, Eric, you probably haven't heard it. Ben's heard it a few times, but um, those sketches were done at SeaWorld down in San Diego uh, back in uh, whatever year before that the film was released, 1973 or 1974. And uh, I think I was 10 years old. And uh, my brother and I went down with my grandmother uh, and Chuck down to SeaWorld, but Chuck never went to the shows with us. He got behind the scenes. Uh, and Scott, if you go back to the to the sketch on A18, and he sat there and you can see on the edge that it is from a sketchbook, you know, it was pulled out of a sketchbook. And, mm. and uh, so he would sketch to get, understand what they would look like and how they moved and get expressions that he wanted. And this is how he learned and, 
and the sea lion, the way that the, the physiology worked and whatnot. So uh, Eric, the, um, the, the short story is that uh, he theorized that if a human were constrained the same way that, you know, the, the anatomy, which is a mammal, the same as a human uh, were constrained, a human were constrained, they'd have to swim the same way. Well, he tested that by uh, at me at 10 and my brother at 11, bringing us down to his pool in, uh, in Newport Beach and tying us up at the ankles, knees and, and uh, elbows and putting fins on us and throwing us in the pool. So, oh my God. Uh, yeah. So it was it literally, uh, it was a hypothesis. Um, we didn't die. So, and we figured out how to swim. But uh, when I saw this sketch, I thought, oh, that was done that day that we were in SeaWorld. That is just ridiculous. And I'd never seen that sketch before. So, oh, look what you've got. They're beautiful, beautiful drawings. Oh, so here you go. I, I've got a Chuck sketchbook page. And what I and oh, wow. Craig showed this to me from the pool. Yeah, I love his stuff. But there, there's a little Craig and a little Todd. No way. Yeah. So like this was before they got finned, roped, and thrown in a pool. But um, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of when Craig showed me this. I'm like, and done. I will take that please. <laughs> so yeah, love love his stuff. Incredible. Yeah, he's a sketch master anyway. So uh, what else? Oh, I know what I was going to challenge you with. I, you know what? I'm going to let you play a little bit. I hope you're up for the, uh, Scott, let's go down to Malcolm Powder. And uh, in, um, so there are some characters and I, that have never been animated. And so let's put that full screen so this is uh, this is uh, Crouch. This is from a, a potential film that Chuck uh, had in mind called uh, 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 Crouch. Out of Malcolm, the film is Malcolm Powder, which is a child and a lot of imagination in there, and half toad and half. What does that say? That's uh, too toad. blurry for me. I can't see it. Let me get over to the images to see. Scott Ryder, you can pipe in if you can read it. I'm not seeing it yet. Um, it's, it says uh, half toad and half something worse. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think almost any ghoulish character that uh, ever, you know, lives in the uni Looney Tunes universe, for me at least, will always result in some kind of sound that would be reminiscent of Peter Lorre in this case. <laughs> you know, I know they've had Dr. Peter Lorre in, in the series, but I think that that the voice of Dr. Peter Lorre would be most appropriate for, yep. for Crouch. That Wouldn't would, you say? I think you're right. Okay. I mean, right. we haven't even seen his teeth yet. Yeah. All right. What about the next one? This is Vertigo. Uh, who was born nice. at the North Pole and known uh, and knows not which way is north. There you go. So <laughs> he's, a, he's obviously uh, in vertigo. Let's go back to vertigo for a second, Scott. Yeah, I mean, with him, I mean, he's, he's got the scarf around his mouth. I think he would be the early kind of version of Kenny from South Park. You know, he would have to... <laughs> you know, I... I mean, that would be the only explanation for me. Okay. I mean, yeah. as, as, you know, when you, as, as, a, as an actor, when you do get those auditions and they do send you a picture, you do probably play with the, the physicality uh, of, of how they design the character. And definitely if the scarf is there, you're going to assume that you won't be able to hear him or... <laughs> All right, we'll go with that. I like it. All right, the next one is uh, Germ, and the view we're seeing is 11,000 times enlarged. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, in this case, you would definitely play against type, and it would probably sound a lot like this, you know, <laughs> almost like a Yosemite Sam type. I could what see that. What are you that. doing? What, why am I in your head? You know, he would, he would not have a small voice. He would have to have a big voice. I like it. All right. And I love the hand, too. I don't know whose hand that is, but I, that's a Chuck Jones hand, if I've ever Look, seen it. It looks like the Grinch's hand. I don't know. It kind of does. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. <laughs> he, had a, he had a real neck with uh, joints and, and, and hand meat. Oh, Anytime Chuck did. Jones would draw a hand, 
It was always just just that close to being anatomically correct, you know? Yep, yep. He you can see the bones was. in those hands. <laughs> well, he, he understood anatomy. He studied anatomy in, in art school and, and always wanted – he, he said it didn't have to be realistic, but it had to be believable. So, you know, the idea that there is flesh and weight and volume in there was very important to him. He, he could envision what was inside and then just draw around it. So that uh, I could, you could see the, the arthritis in those hands, the way that those <laughs> joints are coming in. Yeah, that's good. All right. There, it was probably what yep. Chuck not, might have been feeling at the time in his own hands. Well, knows, he, he you know? definitely, <laughs> if you see pictures of his hands, he had a lot of arthritis. He had a lot of uh, yeah. degenerative bone disease, and, and yet he could still draw until he was but, yeah. you know, 89. It was crazy. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Well, there's the next one. This is Hathead. Oh, my gosh. And it, Hathead. So, so just so you know, each of these characters were designed in the 60s well before anything else like it was ever created. So um, Hathead and his Iron Kentucky Derby. How do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I feel like that, that's what I should have worn to Comic-Con this year. That's, uh, <laughs> well, we know that, what you're wearing That would wear be a great year. cosplay. <laughs> uh, yes, well, Hathead, kind of, I think he would sound a lot like this. Yes. Uh, Very big agree. and official, big barrel chested kind of voice. Ooh, I'm hearing it. That is that's awesome. All right. Almost like, you know, I always say that Mel Blanc has different voices. Some, some of them live in the attic. Like when he did Tweety Bud, you know, Tweety Bud is an attic living voice. I taught it to a putty tad. And when you drop the baby voice and start talking with a New York accent, it becomes Bugs. And I feel like, you know, with this character, he would be that similar to like, like Foghorn Leghorn. You know, like I say, pay attention, son. Foghorn talk here in the barrel of his chest. And when you drop the southern accent and start talking with a French accent, it becomes Pepe Le Pew, right? <laughs> that is a, that is it. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe we would go to a Texas or Kentucky accent with this guy, I, too. Who I like knows? it. I like it. Chuck liked the play on words of Kentucky Derby, so it had to show up some way. So, um, all right, let's go to the next one, Scott. This is Coldfinger and uh, lives in an asbestos submarine in a volcano. And this is uh, frozen electricity. So, yeah, uh, well, definitely for him, he would probably have the s same stutter as like <laughs> Porky, you know, like if he's Coldfinger, he would probably be cold himself. I don't know. <laughs> or else why would he be wearing that fur coat? You know? A good point. That's a good point. Well, and uh, he's got the scrawny little legs coming out. That is uh, <laughs> what, what is actually under that little parka. Someone so, definitely skipped leg day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think the last one, the last one, the real McCoy. Yeah. And I don't know, also known as the Draper, uh, but I'm not sure what that, that reference is. But, uh, you know, real being the film and so uh, I love Neil McCoy. Such amazing designs and such such a great imagination. I mean, he probably would have to talk like he has something in his mouth, maybe. <laughs> yes, yeah? exactly. Yes. But I mean, is he like a like a like a man or a vehicle? I don't know what he is. So I think it'd he's be a little like a boat. Mix yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a mix between like Mel Blanc used to do a speed buggy's voice, right? The uh, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Like that kind of voice. I like it. I would love uh, this guy to do my, my driveway again, if, he, if he's available. Come on back. Re repave my driveway, yeah. <laughs> well, I think he's putting down film wherever he goes. So that would be a perfect, <laughs> film would be a perfect driveway for you. You know, <laughs> that, let's just do that. You know, we got to have all the frames in there. So uh, that is awesome. Scott, do you, uh, I mean, uh, Ben, do you have uh, another question? I was going to share the future of the Chuck Jones gallery uh, before we end. And I know we're sort of coming around the horn a little bit. So, oh, there was one more. I'm sorry. I forgot. This is, uh, this is uh, Crush. And uh, <laughs> the color, a tasteful spoiled orange. Nice. <laughs> so he obviously crushes um, people. But he also looks like he has all uh, pressed up lips. So maybe... <laughs> 
maybe he would have that kind of voice, almost like a droopy kind of thing. Yeah. Ooh, I like that droopy. <laughs> Little hello, Joe. He in there. Yeah. I, uh, maybe he's not wearing his dentures, and that's why his lips have caved in. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ben, you got any oh, uh, got questions? The, that's all the, the sharing that I got. No, I love that, and I love the on the spot character. I ah, well, I tried. You know, that was awesome. well done. Well done. Yes, uh, well that done. Was, thank I you, thank that. you. I hope I book the gig. <laughs> it's all based off of audience uh, applause. Uh, I know. I know we're coming to a close here, but I. Oh, thank you. They got me a me-sized water. Thank you. Oh. Before I go, I know I was supposed to be in here at nine. I know I have. Uh, you know, it's Comic Con. This is a crazy weekend. And uh, for those of you who did show up, and for those of you who have stuck around, and and even the ones that have left. Uh, and, and you guys over Zoom and everyone watching at Zoom, thank you guys so much again for having me here as your guest. Time and time again, and again, I will always say yes. Uh, and I don't know if you guys are around uh, on between now and Sunday. Are you guys going to be back on Zoom or? Ben is on any... tomorrow. The Ben Olson show oh. is tomorrow. Yes. The Ben Olson show. So you guys yeah, the ben Olson uh, show love Ben's is art. Tomorrow, love right back here. here on the walls. And yeah, uh, knows? special knows? things. Yeah, so if you yeah. can get back here to uh, to to hang out and watch, you know, the celebrity host that uh, that's coming in tomorrow into the gallery to be hosting Ben's show, that would be uh, fun to have you back in there because Ben has become one of the the preeminent uh, you know Chuck Jones homage artists that we are showcasing, and you know on his on his uh, I see on his drawing table back behind him that he's got secret stuff that he's going to show tomorrow, so. Uh, so that that no, is, you guys I'm, have such great collections. It makes me jealous. I, I, I wish I brought my <laughs> stuff, but you know, that only means I should probably probably buy something from the gallery before I leave. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll end on a Bugs Bunny song for you guys. Someone's rocking my dream boat. Someone's invading my dreams. We were sailing along, singing a song. Suddenly something went wrong. Uh, you guys have been awesome. Thank that you. That is for awesome. Having here yay and, uh, thank yeah. you hey the, um, uh, yeah the, 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 uh, that's not all folks you guys have uh, a few things to say right but yeah well uh, you know what Eric, here did you uh have you noticed uh i don't know if you, if you the first time in the gallery today or if you've seen anything on there about what we're planning because you know there's more interactivity with the chuck jones galleries that are coming and one of those things that we've been working on for the last two plus years is this virtual reality uh, world that we're creating for the art business and the art, you know, gallery experiences. And so, you know, it, in the back of the gallery, there's actually uh, some Oculus headsets that allow you to actually experience what we're creating. Now, two things I'm going to share before you leave, because I want to get your reaction to it. Um, and I'm not even sure Ben has seen this. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so over the last two years, we've created a virtual reality headset uh, available uh, gallery, Chuck Jones gallery. And I'm just going to share this on the screen now. Scott, can you uh, see that now? Can you guys see what's gone there? Looks good. Oh, my okay. gosh. So this is an actual and along with Cordar and Acme Labs that are launching this week, uh, we are putting out a, one, a series of artwork, but this virtual reality experience that you can actually experience in real time, take a look at this fly through that was created from uh, the space that's available in the back of the gallery to see. So this one doesn't have any audio, but you can see that we can put videos on the, on the gallery experience. Each one of these can have uh, stories associated with the pieces of artwork on there. This is part of the backgrounds that are here, part of the masterpiece collection that are being released next month that, uh, that will be both be, fine art prints from backgrounds from famous cartoons that have been beautifully remastered along with an accompanying uh, NFT, non-fungible token, oh. digital piece of artwork that goes along with it uh, as an authentication piece. But uh, this virtual reality gallery is, is launching this week at Comic-Con for the first time for the virtual reality experience in those Oculus goggles. So, um, that is what I envision as a eh, recovering engineer in the computer engineering world. 
that uh, that I envision as a, a an addition, not a. It doesn't supplant reality, but I see it as um, what's coming next. You know, and and well, to be absolutely. an extra thing. So, you know, if you want to step back there at some point. Now, the other thing that is coming. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the promotion. We just started it a couple of days ago. It's a it's a character. You saw some characters. You did some voices for characters that uh, Chuck created that people hadn't seen before. There was a character that was briefly seen decades ago called Rabbit. That uh, and it's mm-hmm. it's being re released as the Lost Rabbit now, and it comes from a Chuck Jones character. And uh, actually, hel- Ben is actually helping. So, but there is an entire backstory for uh, the lost rabbit. And I'm going to show you a promo that is just being finished. And uh, hopefully you can hear this well enough. Let's do this. I'm going to share sound and do this. And can you see a dark black screen? That's usually yes, a good Yes, I can. Thing. All right, here we go. Let's see if we can hear it. So there you go. You got the first glimpse of, uh, of Chuck's lost rabbit that's being uh, launched over the next uh, couple of months. But the uh, the augmented reality experience that uh, is going around Comic-Con right now that you can find Looney Tunes characters and and uh, that you can you can find your way over to the Sparks Gallery. Um, will uh, encapsulate uh, the, the lost rabbit character over the coming days. But just for you, Eric, I asked them, put together something that might give a glimpse for the lost rabbit, because, you know, only a few people get that first glimpse. You put on those Oculus headsets, and that's the only place you'll be able to see the actual uh, images that are being developed for the NFT release in the fall of the lost rabbit character. So it's kind of a cool little... uh, uh, insight, but you can't tell anybody. You can't redraw it. You got to just, uh, yeah, just lock those. Well, how can I say you lock? You can't, you can't zip your lip. You know, you're paying Not a Comic Con at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's but, uh, the uh, wrong place for secrets. <laughs> but that is, uh, that's what's the future that I see as uh, Chuck Jones Gallery is going to be in the virtual reality world uh, before you know it. We're already there. So hope you'll be a part of it. You'll be, uh, you know, visiting us in, in, in virtual worlds before we all know it. It's quite amazing and uh, really cool to see the birth of it. And, uh, you know, that's just uh, it's where the, ki- the kids are looking these days. And, uh, you know, if you appreciate it here in person, obviously galleries will still exist, but just say you can't or aren't able to. I think the accessibility is what's uh, going to attract a lot of people to this. So congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad uh, uh, I'm glad and honored to uh, to have been here to see it. And, and uh, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. All right, Ben, anything more? Uh, I just want to say thank you, Eric. It's always a pleasure. And when I'm out there, let's eat it up. I'd 
you pick the place. I'll drive. <laughs> well, hey, I, I'm not. I'm not leaving. I'm. You know, I'm. I'm gonna hang around uh, this weekend. So hopefully, hopefully, I'll see you guys again uh, between yeah. now and Sunday. And uh, and again, thank you guys. Yeah, anytime you guys want to grab a bite, you know, you know where I live. <laughs> nice. All right. Good to see you. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna. Hey we're gonna go ahead and sign off now. And uh, thank you all for uh, for joining us both on. The, uh, the virtual world, Ben, thanks for hanging out. I know it's a little late. It's about, what, 6 o'clock in the morning or something like that? You've been – you're in, like, like you know, time zone warp, I'm sure. But uh, it I'm was fun hanging breakfast. out. I'm going to eat <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate you hanging out with me and, and uh, being able to share and be so enthusiastic like you always are. So that was fun. Um, I heard things I've never heard before. <laughs> I've seen things I've never seen before. And I would gladly hang around just to hang out with you, period, even if we weren't talking about that. Yep. But, yeah, dude, uh, I had people screenshotting my reaction to your George <laughs> Lucas thing and sending it through Instagram Messenger. Message. And they're like, we just want you to see what your face looks like. And I'm like, I'm genuinely stunned right now. Uh, well yeah. you know obviously we need to hang out more and i'll share more stories i'm down all right brother thank right, you very much for joining yep. hey you thanks still everybody got some more artwork to do don't you uh, which are oh you want to <laughs> wait wait for me scott do i have more to share well I, I don't know i don't know last. craig do you have more to share i don't know ah, scott there we go all right you know what let's uh let's go ahead and take a look Scott, kind of where, what what things what things? I love that. I love that a lot. I'm not. I I got characters mainly done. Yep. I got to get the background in. Okay. But I am. I am. Uh, <laughs> this is Planet. Oh. Joel says more. Ah, okay. uh, well, Scott. Joel okay, I got. I, I'm good. So, Scott. Scott Ryder. Um, uh, what images have we not shared yet? Let's go play because I don't remember. As I said. Um, oh. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we didn't. Say, oh, there we uh -huh. go. Uh -huh. That is actually uh -huh. the original ink and uh, ink line for uh, for uh, Take Me to Your Leader, and so uh, limited edition that was done back in the nineties. Um, I mean, I I wish if I literally I was about to go toward the screen and see if I could you know zoom in you know and and pinch it so I could look at you know because that's what I want to do. I want to go in and see all the detail, but. Uh, you know, Chuck's, Chuck's, uh, you know, not the cold duck. It's the old duck, of course, you know, when it comes to that. Um, what else you, what else did I put in there, Scott? Oh, right. Yeah. I forgot about that. I was going to have, uh, Eric Bowser do a voice for the funny, uh, bowl. Cause I mean, Chuck, Chuck loved the puns and, and, you know, that yak, 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 yak is a laugh, but it's also an animal. So, you know, he's got, this is just the way he doodled and, and then you got the bowl from Bully for Bugs down below. And uh, I think that's one of the funniest uh, bowls that I've ever seen. Um, what else did I not show, Scott? I, I think that I, was it. Let's see. Um, I think was there, um, go back to some of the layout drawings because I think we went through those quickly um love that you got to show the uh, bugs and marvin again because i that one i think we sort of we, we talked about a little bit um i just i think it's hilarious the scale yeah i know that's a tiny marvin that's that tiny yep yeah uh, yeah <laughs> well he did sort of grow and and shrink in different cartoons you know when when it was necessary so <laughs> <laughs> he needed to be there. So, um, Gossamers, uh, Scott, was there, Scott Dickin, was there something else that you had in mind that I forgot that you remember? Hey, uh, hey. Well, no, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what you got there, Craig. No, that's, I think, let me, uh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's scroll through them one more time and see if I didn't remember anything. Um, oh, okay. Well, this again, Chuck Jones film production, gag drawing from that wasn't used uh from uh another froggy evening uh chris columbus remembering his singing frog uh obviously wouldn't sing for anybody else uh the frankenstein gag uh storyboard that was done at chuck jones film productions for another froggy evening as well 
Um, love the Igor character. And then the eight panel setup, um, like I said, I'd never seen any of these before. I'd never heard of the Acme Box of Horrors, but, um, but you know. But it's brilliant. I, I, it, it is. I mean, obviously an Acme uh, Box of Horrors would be a horror to the coyote. So <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, in the shaking. Yeah, I can, you can envision what the animation would have looked like at this because he's yes. kind of stumbling off into the Neverland. So um, uh, the Princess Die drawing, I got to say, that was, that was pretty cool. I, I remember when that was done in the early 90s. It was right about the time that I came to work with a company and, uh, and that it was done. And, you know, obviously Princess Di was one of the most famous people in the world and that it was going to be given to her, the cell of this, uh, much cleaner, obviously. It would have been inked, but uh, what a great pose. Is there, is there an image of that cell somewhere just to, uh, to see? I, do, I, I don't, don't have I now, don't, I don't know. I'm sure that a copy was made. Uh, but I didn't see it. And then the Michael Jordan uh, images, the drawings that were in there uh, with the note that was sent to him after his father passed away in, in uh, 1994. So no one could uh, do a sad. I always love this. I just, and he did a few different drawings for Wall Street Journal and a couple other magazines or newspapers and magazines when they would ask. But <laughs> the shock of it all. Yeah, and the detail in there, because you have all of the characters that you love, you know, coming out of this thing between Taz and who is that character at the top? Who's the one in the bottom next to Michigan J. Frog, just to the right? Um, I'm not getting it. Uh, I think it, Charlie Dog is three up. Maybe and then uh, maybe that, is that Porky Pig getting squished in there? I think it's Tweety. And then Roadrunner is right above him. Then uh, I think it's Charlie Dog. Oh, no, that can't be Roadrunner because Roadrunner is up at top. So who's above Porky? Wait, where's Porky? I thought Porky is right above the, the frog getting kind of squished out. I think that's Elmer. Who's that behind Taz there? Um, at the top? Is that, uh, is that a different one of Chuck's dogs? The... Um, because that's Charlie Dog down below. No, that can't be Porky because he's, got, he's got whiskers. Maybe it is a chow hound. Maybe that's the more likely up top. If you move it down a little bit, Scott. Yeah, I think the dog also came up in, uh, in the poker piece. The, uh, um, what was the, I think he, because. Full dog so, house. Full dog house. So I think actually. That dog showed up in there, and he said it was a Tex Avery dog that he uh, that he took. Because okay, I, one of the great when I was you know this must have been ninety whenever that came out ninety five ninety six. Chuck was working on Full Dog House, which is the the uh, characters playing poker, the dogs playing poker around, and um, and it's all the dogs that he had, and, but he included um, a few others. Uh, from Frizz and others, but he, uh, I, I got a voicemail. This is before cell phones, and and I got a voicemail when I got home on a weekend. And he said, you know, I'm working on this uh, this dogs playing poker uh, piece, and um, you know, Marion and I cannot decide whether or not the coyote is a dog because he's in one of the the, the key positions, but. But we just, we're not sure whether or not he should be counted as a dog. And so I thought, what other uh, job in the entire world can you, you get a call wondering whether or not the coyote is a dog and fits in a dog playing poker uh, art piece that's going to go on black um, uh, velvet, you know, and be printed that way. So, um, but I called Chuck back and he said, don't worry about it. We uh, decided that he wasn't a dog and we put one of Tex Avery's uh, famous dogs in there. So I think that same dog ended up in, in uh, the full dog house as well. So um, let's keep going, Scott. Um, oh, the, the New Year's. So there are some other great New Year's images that Chuck did over the, yep. That, uh, that goes up right in the corner above the year 2000. So, but I, again, 
that um, that that coyote Batman, you know, the splat man, you, you just know what's happening. And he, even though he's looking at it, but Chuck did the New Year's babies pretty well as well. So I think love it's that. Funny that he had it tattooed. Uh, 1999 looks like it's on the baby's leg and then he erased it and <laughs> put it on sack. I know. <laughs> That's the detail work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what else you got, Scott? Uh, then these, are, yeah, these are, these are just, I wanted to challenge uh, these, uh, mo many of these, I don't even know if they're the original drawings, but I, they were great oh, characters. Yeah. We, I could actually see doing limited editions of these characters just because they need to exist out there and they've got a great backstory and who knows maybe they will uh have a new life at some point actually steve fasadi that was at chuck jones film production started to do the, the development process and malcolm powder was one of the ones that he was talking about so but i yeah i mean it's a great idea the real yes. mccoy he loved the pun as i said so Let's go back to the uh, the layout drawings for a second. I mean, the what's up? I mean, I don't know if there's ever been a better drawing than the uh, the what's up or doc drawing that we I, had. I am done. Ooh, can you can you zoom in on that a little bit, Scott? Like that's freaking amazing. Yeah, especially with a little extra red body on there. Ooh, look at the detail on that thing. Ooh, yeah. That's pretty, pretty spectacular, man. So is Scott, is Scott gonna let me, I've been very good and I haven't spoiled anything. Is Scott gonna let me spoil something or not? I don't know. You, why don't you text him and, and ask him if you can spoil something? No, he'll just give me the thumbs down right there on the screen. <laughs> got it, oh, okay, got it, yes. Don't do it, don't do it, yeah. This is I mean, good. who knew we're at the end, right? I mean, well, I tell you what, I tell you what, if does anybody on who's on Zoom or either there in, in Comic Con have any questions about the artwork, about anything? I mean, I'm more than willing to uh, um, to answer any questions. Joel always has a question. Uh, Joel Frisky has the answers to his own questions, though. Uh, exactly. He's on the horse, isn't he? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Bugs was on the horse. You are correct, Joel. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, nice. I, I love the, the gag on the Rab, Robin Hood Daffy. Yeah, I, that... <laughs> I think that, that version, when he did Porky as Cadet and then as Friar Pig. Friar, yep. Uh, it was are probably my two favorite renditions of Porky Pig in any of the films. Yep, no doubt. All right, sounds like. Uh, All right, Scott says no questions. I think we're good. I'm gonna call it then. It's almost nine o'clock your or midnight your time. What am I thinking? Oh jeez. Oh jeez. You know what? All right. I I don't even, I'm not even going to, I'm uh, just. No, nope, it's, I know. Yep. Nope. Happy Comic-Con, Ben. Not yes. at, uh, not at, not at midnight, I think, uh, probably good. Yeah. I mean, I got one for you and Fabio just in case, but uh, I'll, I'll hold mine for tomorrow. Hold yours for tomorrow. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it tomorrow, for sure. All right. Cool. Hey, Scott, thank you for uh, getting Eric in there and, and uh, getting Andy over. And I just, it was fun. Very good time. Well, and ben, I wish you were here, but it kind of feels like you are. So. Uh, well, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to you tomorrow, Ben. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Right man. back here. Tomorrow. Yeah, there make sure everybody's back here to see Ben and the special guest host. Yes. Celebrity will be here in person <laughs> in Comic-Con. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. Have a good night, everybody. All right. All right. Bye-bye.